Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on mandate. Get it on and welcome to my live book signing. I'll be taking your questions, signing your books. And if you want to get some of those signed books, you go to premiercollectibles.com slash Corolla. So uh, Matt, the Porcelain Punisher, has uh, collected questions that you guys have submitted and he shall uh, give them to me. In no particular order. So uh, I guess we should uh, get to getting here, Matt. What do you think? Well, first of all, Ace Man, congratulations on the new book, I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, Navigating Our All-Woke, No-Joke Culture. You did it again. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see it because this is the first time I've really been able to uh, thumb through the book. You know, you write it and you edit it and you do the audio version, but you don't see the actual real McCoy until the very end. And, and here we are. So, uh, thank you. And, uh, questions. Yeah. yeah. So to, before we jump into the main set of questions here, can you talk a little bit about your inspiration for creating this book? Maybe a little bit about the process. Was this easier now that it's your fifth book? I, uh, well, the, the inspiration is always to get paid. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Most of the money I've received, what they call in advance has already gone up my nose. But there's still a little bit left to get. So I did, uh, in 50 years, we'll all be chicks. And everyone seemed to really like that book because it was just me telling the truth and being funny simultaneously. And uh, people seemed to like that format. So then I wrote an autobiograph autobiography and then a dad book and then a, you know, another book called President Me. And uh, I've written uh, Me and Dr. Drew wrote a love line book. And then uh, I took some, like about five years off. So I wrote four books in five years time and then I just stopped and it'd been, you know, five years. So I thought, uh, I think it's time to write another book. And uh, what kind of book do I want to write? And I thought, I think it'll be in the vein of in 50 years, we'll all be chicks. Uh, no holds barred. Lots of, lots of jokes, lots of critiques, possibly some tears from uh, folks that read it and um, exquisitely truthful in a day and age where uh, people are very scared to speak their mind. There is no fear in this book. So, uh, and if you want to have a laugh, it's a pretty good, pretty good thing to read as well. I agree. Well, we have a bunch of questions here. And uh, again, if you want to get your signed copy of the book, check out premiercollectibles.com slash Corolla. A lot of these questions were submitted by uh, your fans. So first we have Kelly in Temperance, Michigan, asking, Ace, what is your mantra? Hmm. I don't have a mantra. I, I get up and I just go to work every day. And then I think of new things to do. And then I think about how to either achieve things I want to achieve or um, participate in things I want to participate in. I, I don't I, I don't have a plan. I don't have a mantra. I have things like I wanted to do professional Trans Am race and I got a sponsor and I got the guys to bring the car out from Florida and had it all worked out. It was supposed to take place at the beginning of May. They pulled the plug because the whole COVID-19 thing. I found out that they rescheduled it for the beginning of December. And I said, I went back in on that race. Now we have to figure out if the guys who run the race team who are out of Florida, if the sponsor is willing to step up. There's a whole bunch of stuff we have to refigure. I just made the proclamation I want to do that race. Um, I get up and I go, I want to write a book or I go, I want to make a documentary about uh, Dan Gurney or I go, I want to do a car race. And then once, or I, I want a condominium in Malibu. Once I make the proclamation, then I set about a way to make it into an actual achievable goal to turn it into, to actually get from that point where I make the proclamation. I want to do that. My second professional trans am race. I got to get to the point where at some point I'm in that car and we're going 150 miles an hour down the front straight at Laguna Seca. So that's my process. And uh, it works most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't work, but that's that's my, my life process. Oh, yeah, I wake up and think I want to be a great parent. That's right. 
<laughs> I forgot about that. You've also bestowed upon me uh, what I would consider a mantra, don't do your best, do my best. That's right. Well, you mentioned racing before, and we do have a question here from Thomas in Houston, Texas. Adam, I know you are a Datsun and a Porsche collector. If you could keep only one car from your collection, which car would it be? Well, let's... Man, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to do this without factoring price in. So let's remove price just for the shits and giggles and say that uh, Pete Brock, as you guys know from watching my documentaries, is an amazing designer and he designed the Shelby Daytona and he worked on the Corvettes back in the day and he's all around good guy, still alive. His BRE race team, I th I think, was like the winningest Datsun, you know, unbeatable Datsun team ever. And I, I would take a BRE five ten, which which I own of Pete Brock's. I I don't know why Porsche nine thirty five would have to be second, but obviously the Porsche nine thirty five is worth tons more than the BRE five ten. But in a weird way, there's a lot of or quite a few nine thirty fives in existence. There's only two BRE 510 Datsuns out there, and, and I have them. So if you want to look up, uh, you want to Google that BRE 510, I, I think you'll see, I think you'll see Pete's, <clears throat> Pete went to the Pasadena Art School or Design Center, or whatever it is. You will see just in the graphics alone the, the genius of that guy's design. All right. Well, you know that, of course, your book is all about navigating our all woke, no joke culture. We got Crystal from Round Rock, Texas, asking, is there any chance that the woke culture will burn itself out? Yeah, I think you're uh, I think they're I think they're in danger of losing some of their fans and some of their support. Um, I. I feel like whenever the movement gets too far down the tracks, you end up losing sensible people. Um, you know, I always cite PETA as an example. PETA was probably a group that most Americans generally agreed with 20 years ago. And now we look at them as a bunch of whack jobs. And if there's anything, you know, if anyone says PETA says, I'm like, yeah, okay. And, uh, it's like saying your crazy aunt Nellie says you just you just tune out. So now when I find out that the uh, all woke no group no uh, all woke no no joke I should say progressive group is on to something I'm I'm already kind of tuned out. You know when they've figured out another transgression against them or some uh, something when they announce they find something problematic I'm I'm already I'm already tuned out. So. Yes, they're going to lose uh, a big chunk of this country if they if they keep going, but they shall keep going because, as I always tell everyone, it's right in the name, progressive movement. It can't stop. It has no limits. It doesn't know how to pump the brakes. And it's not there to get anything done. I don't see. Here's the thing. If you if you put a group together. All right, let's just say I put a group together. And the goal of my group is to stop people from littering. It's to clean up my neighborhood. And it's to get people uh, a raise awareness on recycling. Okay. Well, then I would form that group. I would set about to fulfill that task. And at some point when I looked around... And I saw that the neighborhood was clean and it was trash free. And I saw that my neighbors and community were recycling. Then I would say, okay, we can back off a little bit because I started this group to clean up the neighborhood and now the neighborhood's clean. But what if I started the group to tell my goddamn neighbors what to do? But I said, I'm not starting this group to tell you what to do. I'm starting this group to clean up the trash in the neighborhood. And they went, oh, okay. Well, that sounds like a good group. I'll join. But at a certain point, I'm telling them 
what they can do on their front porch, and uh, if they want to run wind chimes, they have to uh, pass it through me, and I have to sign off on it, and they're going to have to uh, pull a permit to uh, run the wind chimes or a hum hummingbird feeder, and you start going, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought the deal was is you wanted to clean up the neighborhood. Well, that's what I told you. But what I want to do is run your goddamn life. But I didn't state that. Because if I stated I'd like to run your goddamn life, well, then you wouldn't sign up. So I said I wanted to clean up the neighborhood. But I ain't stopping. I'm going to run your goddamn life. That's what they want to do. They don't say it because you wouldn't sign up. PETA just wants to save the bunny rabbits from uh, getting their eyes all tested with the shampoo conditioner. Okay, that sounds good. Now we're into running your goddamn life. That's how it all works. It's, it's called a progressive movement, people. Better keep your fucking eyes open. Beware of campaigns that never have an end. There's no ending. There is no, oh, well, we're just worried about secondhand smoke. Okay, so we'll get rid of smoking. Yeah, well, we're worried about third-hand smoke now. Oh, okay, well, uh, we'll stop smoking altogether. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll vape. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're not going to allow vaping. Remember, that's, that's just water. That's just vapor. Now, yeah, no, none of that. Oh, okay, wait a minute. I thought you didn't like smoke. No, they don't care about any of that stuff. They want to control you. I mean, look what's going on. I mean, I'm in, I'm in California. We, we're locked down. We don't need to be locked down. They want control. Oh, you can go to the beach. You can go in the water, but you can go on the sand. You've got to wear a mask on the sand, but, uh, but you can't lay down on the beach. Uh, sounds arbitrary to me. Yeah, yeah, it is arbitrary because they want to control your ass. You should wake up to that, people. These people in charge, they're, they like being in charge. You uh, dancing to the beat of your own drummer and doing your own thing and come on. I mean, just take a look at California. Hey, people used to come out here so they could be left alone and do what they wanted to do. But then the people got in control and now they got rules and they don't stop and they don't peel it back and they don't pump the brakes. They just keep going. So I'm on. Are you on to them? Seems abundantly evident that we're on to them, and you should know what you're getting in for and what you signed up for. All right. Well said. God damn. 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 All right, so here's a question from Nick in New South Wales. As a fellow hypervigilant person, if you have moments of total disillusionment, what are some things to keep in mind to get you back into a good state of mind? Hmm. Hypervigilance, good, good on the road. Not a lot of fender benders, and you don't rear end people. You don't get in a lot of accidents. So that's good. It's good. Uh, keeps you neat in the garage and in the shop. What gets you off your track, and what gets you on? Um, I will. Uh, I will say, easy answer: the ocean. Just go to the ocean. Just get your feet in the ocean. Hit the sand. That. Um, real, you know, vigorous exercise, you know, that, that moment where you're on the rowing machine and there's three minutes left and you're going to try to make uh 700 meters in the last three minutes and you just get that breathing going and, uh, and go at it. behind the wheel of a race car. Everything's gone. All you're doing is driving that car. Can't hear anything. Can't, can't think about a thing. Never have a thought other than other than exactly what you're doing. Um, there's, uh, you know, for me, surround yourself. I'll get a little philosophical here, but uh, what, what I do is I just put stuff out there, carrot at the end of the, carrot at the end of the stick. I will oftentimes line up a steak dinner and a martini with a good friend, but it's, it's never on a Monday and it's never on a Wednesday. It's always Sunday at six o'clock, which means you have to put in your full week. You've got to go at it. You got to make the hay while the sun shines, but six o'clock Sunday night, 
You're going to have a porterhouse and a martini with one of your good friends. And if you kind of set that out there, uh, it really makes that week a lot easier because I'll find myself on a Wednesday going, oh, man, what a week. And I'll go, ooh, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, Sunday. So uh, for me, long hikes in the nature, bike ride, mountain biking. Mountain biking is probably one of those things you're sweating and it's in its commanding focus. Like when you're hauling ass down a trail, it's, it just commands extreme focus. There's no looking at your phone. There's no even really thinking about other things in that moment because there's a danger factor that is pulling focus. It's sort of driving the car. I mean, think about, think about when you're, where your mind is at when you're engaged in a potentially dangerous behavior. So if you're taking the other day, I took a piece of wood and I was pushing it through the table saw and I was like, I was like free handing it. I was just, I didn't have the fence. I slid the fence out of the way and I was just having to kind of follow the line and freehand it, which means you move the opposite way. It's like, I don't know. It's kind of like driving the rear end of a hook and ladder pickup you know, hook and ladder fire truck or something like that. You pull it toward you, it goes one way, you push it out and try to say, when I'm engaged in that behavior, that's all I'm thinking about. That's that's all I'm thinking about. I was just over at the other shop and Sean's working on a part and he's going to color sand it. He's going to buff it out. And he's going to get his rubbing compound. But then he's explaining to me that he's got to tape off the edges because if that hydraulic buffer that he's working with hits an edge it's going to pull some of the paint off and get down to the primer do you think when sean has his little buffing wheel with his rubbing compound on it buffing out the paint job he did on the tail on the 510 do you think he's thinking about trump or or biden or tweets or climate change or or his kids or anything else he's simply 100 percent focused on where he is and when you're going down that steep downgrade on that mountain bike looking for the crevasse looking for the rock looking not to get thrown off and run down the hill roll down the hill do you think your mind's anywhere other than staring at that front wheel and looking 10 feet ahead of you it isn't conversely when you're sitting on the commode and you're staring at your phone now you're totally sucked into that digital world so Get on that mountain bike and get down that trail or fire up that table saw. You use a chop saw. You use a miter saw. You got your hand in there. You're dropping this 10-inch spinning 60-tooth carbide blade. You think your mind's drifting off? You think you're thinking about something, uncutting it right on that line and not having it kick back or catch a finger in that blade? No, you're right there. Obviously, you can't spend your life going down a hill on a mountain bike, and you can't spend your life pushing a piece of one by through a table saw. But the more of those behaviors you engage in, the saner you shall be. Thank you. Again, Hold well on. said. Hold We're on. clapping back here Hold behind on. the glass. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there we go. All right, changing gears here. Here's a question from uh, Eric in Fairfax, Virginia. What's the golden rule to guide my daughter through life? Mm. Well, best I can tell. Um, I mean, obviously, the golden rule is the golden rule. You know, it's 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 super universal. Like, if you don't want it to happen to you, then don't do it to other people. So, I mean, other people. I mean, imagine the immediate utopia we would be living in, you know, it's like, well, if you wouldn't, you know, if somebody's dog took a crap on your lawn, you would want them to bag it and tag it, right? Okay, well, then same applies when you're walking your dog. But then the same would apply, would apply to stabbing strangers or, you know, cheating folks out of money. I mean, golden rule, everything is immediately fixed. As far as the daughters go, Maybe this is a little cathartic because uh, I have this with my uh, daughter to some degree, which is, and, and many people that are unhappy, anyone that's unhappy, it's because they don't appreciate what they have when they have it. 
And it's hard in this modern era, especially young girls and boys who just want to move on to the next thing. You know, my, my daughter got a iPhone eight. She was talking about getting an iPhone 10 five minutes later. That's natural. It's predictable, but it also leads to this spiral that's very unhealthy. So what we need to do is kind of stop and appreciate. And unfortunately, kids aren't very good at stopping and appreciating. So what you must do is then get them to do things that makes them wish they were back to where they were. See, so everyone thinks, well, I'm just even. I'm just in the middle. What I'm doing right now is just even. Well, you wouldn't feel that way if somebody said, go out and mow the lawn in the hot sun. You would think about getting back to what you called even, and that would be awesome because you'd be sitting in air conditioning, watching TV, drinking an iced tea. So if you're sitting in air conditioning, watching TV and drinking an iced tea and thinking, eh, this is just even, this is I'm right in the middle, this is a five, that's true. Go out and mow the lawn. 45 minutes in when you're sweating your ass off, think about what you used to define as even. I think that even will get upgraded to great. And I took my son last week because doing a bunch of yard work. I had a bunch of guys over there. And I said, uh, hey, help them. I need a full hour every day. You get down there. And I showed up one day. I came out in the morning. He was pushing a wheelbarrow up the hill with a bunch of hefty bags in it filled with, you know, leaves and branches. And he was sweating his ass off. He was about 45, 50 minutes in. And uh, he looked at me at the top of the hill, kind of red faced. And he was like, this sucks. And I'm like, good. That's right. It does suck. Imagine doing it eight hours or 10 hours a day. You want to do that? He's like, no, I want to work somewhere as like as an intern or work at the Target and stock shelves or something. Right. But if I didn't make him push that wheelbarrow up the hill, get red faced and sweaty, then when he did take the job at the Target or interning at Jimmy Kimmel Live, he wouldn't appreciate it. So get out of your even, get into that zone, throw yourself in the freezing swimming pool, go out and run that trail, go out and break that sweat, go out and do that yard work. Then when you come in and you get into the air conditioning and you have that sip of iced tea, you're no longer even, you're doing great. And that's what we have to create. Changing gears here, we have a question from Adam in Agora Hills, California. What's your favorite eatery in the San Fernando Valley? And for people who aren't local, maybe you can tell them what the San Fernando Valley is actually like. The San Fernando Valley is a large, large patch of Los Angeles. It's right over hill. It's over the hill from Hollywood. Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, basically it's flat, it's hot, it has zero culture. And if you don't believe me, there, it, it, it could very well be the largest per capita, you know, 2020 in the United States. It is the largest populace with zero comedy clubs, not one comedy club. And I bet you there's not much in the way of interpretive dance either. Now, there is Flappers, which is on the edge. I mean, that's on the foothill, Burbank, uh, Glendale, sorry, Burbank, like the edge. But there is nothing in the middle of this valley with thousands and thousands, millions of people living in it. No comedy club. So obviously, you know, it ain't Manhattan. It ain't New York City. Okay. Um the culture is zero culture. The culture is basically Mexico now. It's just sort of turning into Mexico. Uh, so with that in mind, you're not going to find a lot of good Hungarian or Polish food there, but you can find good Mexican food. And uh, for me, there's a, there's a couple of places. Um, I'll give you two spots. One is a place called uh, La Cabanita. Now that's not in the valley that's sort of adjacent to the valley and Montrose, which is 
sort of its own little valley, but not quite in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, the other place I will uh, tell you is called, uh, and uh, La Cabanita has that Mexican food, but it's mole. They do a lot of mole stuff, which is just awesome. Get the uh, enchiladas with the mole sauce on. It's a chocolatey, rich sauce. It's so goddamn good. All right. Then uh, on a, a simpler note, uh, Good Neighbor, just a diner right off of uh, wherever Ventura turns into Coanga or whatever it is, but just good cottage fries, good people, simple, basic, nothing, no, uh, not hoity-toity, and uh, very easy very easy. Come in, sit down, get an omelet, get some pancakes, get a cup of coffee, have a conversation. All family run. Everyone's kind of co-op, like everyone who works there uh, owns it. And uh, I've written both my movies there. I, I would meet Kevin Hench there. They'd give us our booth in the corner. He'd open his computer and we'd just pour the coffee, get the omelet and go to town. All right. Well, a lot of people uh, like to think and claim that they are indeed woke. But David in McDonough, Georgia, wants to know what percentage of civilization is truly woke like you? Mm. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm always wondering who actually cares versus who cares that other people think they care. I'm always assuming everyone is more wrapped up in appearances than they are in what they actually think about or do. And it's not a direct answer for your question, but it was a little satirical, the question. So I'll, I'll just make, I'll just take it my own direction. Um, if you want to know what I'm into, if you want to know what I like, then you can simply look at me. And when you look at me, you're going to see me with a lot of old dots and race cars. You're going to see me, with a lot of tools, doing a lot of building, doing a lot of projects, building this studio, building out the other studio, or you might find me making a documentary or, or doing a podcast or writing a book. So if you'd like to know what I do, well, if you want to know whether I like driving vintage cars or race cars, there's hours of footage online of me driving race cars. But what if all of a sudden race cars just became super popular like last Wednesday. And I just, everyone just started coming out of the woodwork going, Oh yeah, I'm totally into race cars. That's a big deal. Ironically, with the word race in it, but oh, I love race cars. I love those old dots. It's like, okay, where's all the footage of you talking about it? Where's all the footage of you participating in it? Meaning you're talking about black lives matter. Good. You're talking about uh, Me Too, good. You're talking about the environment and other things, good. Now, there should be a rich history of you discussing this and you participating in this. Marches, events, or how about just donations? How much Black Lives Matter has been around for eight years? Did you cut them a check four years ago? Or are you making a video today to let people know what you think of this organization, how you stand behind them? And if you stand behind them, that's fantastic. Where's where's the check? Where's the canceled check from when you cut them a check in 2016? So my thing is, is if you're into a group, if you're into Black Lives Matter, if you're into uh, the ACLU or PETA or Whatever, whatever subject du jour is, Greenpeace, what have you, good. Now, let's see a rich history of your participation. Uh, again, checks, events, rallies, hosting benefits at your palatial Beverly Hills homes. Uh, that's awesome, and I respect that. But if I don't see a history of it, or your history goes back to last Wednesday, then maybe I think you're not really that into it. Again, I'm not a big fan of PETA. So if you look back into my history, you won't find me cutting their organization checks. I do like vintage automotive racing. So if you go back in my history, you'll see tons of events that I've participated in. But I don't claim 
right now that I'm a huge PETA fan. See, that's the difference. I'm consistent. I don't. I didn't like PETA 10 minutes ago. I don't like them now. You claiming to be down with all these causes now makes me suspicious because I don't see a history of it. That's good. All right, so we have another question here from Thomas in Chicago, Illinois. Adam, longtime fan, keep it rocking. What is a project you haven't done but hope to do? Um, well, obviously, Morgan Fairchild's always been on my hit list. Um, that's something I sort of made a promise to myself about. It's probably seven. Ah, no, I was 15. So she's out there, and she's kind of my Moby Dick, you know, my white whale. She's always out there. So I'd like to do that, you know. It's always a goal. Um, professionally? Yeah, that might not be a bad answer. Um, oh, okay. Well, if you want to shift gears. I should have clarified. Oh, fault. we're going to go that way. Okay, well, we answered that part, the spiritual, emotional part, sexual part, obviously. Uh, now we move uh, professionally. Um, I think I would like to maybe participate in uh, the race uh, Le Mans. That would be uh, quite a, a bucket list thing. And I have spoken to a uh, writer and producer and creator of the whole Fast and Furious franchise, Chris Morgan, a few times. And he's always go, every time I see him, he always goes, I'm going to write you a part, put you in as like the salty mechanic and, you know, fast 11 or something like that. And I go, okay. So uh, showing up in one of those big, iconic, you know, sappy movies that makes $200 billion and, and you know, it's, you know, does does a huge gross in, you know, Japan and China and Germany and stuff like that. It's just, just having some sort of, you know, three minutes of screen time in one of those mega blockbuster things, even if it's a, a, a stupid part in a cameo. I don't know. That, sound, that sounds fun. It also sort of sounds like, yeah, sounds like uh, the last thing left for me. I mean, I've, I've starred in a few rom-coms. I've made a bunch of docs. I've wrote, written a bunch of books. I've done, you know home improvement shows and, you know, sketch shows. And I, I guess I've done a lot of stuff. So I've never done that. I've never been in one of those big movies. And so uh, I think we'll just say that. Uh, driving at uh, Lamar or a walk-on bit roll in a Fast and Furious or Hobbs versus Shaw movie. Well, along those same lines, Stephanie from Portland, Oregon is asking, what is your favorite movie? Hmm. Well, you know, there's so many, there's so many movies that are so good and, and, you know, who's going to argue with, well, I like the Godfather. I like Shawshank Redemption. I mean, it's, it's kind of pointless in my world to make that argument. And so for me, as a person that always likes to sort of pull something off the beaten path and, and again, like you know, telling people, go watch The Godfather. It's like, oh, they've already seen it. That, that, that doesn't, that's not going to change your life. So I'll always just pick my uh, little sports movie. Um, oh, God. <laughs> forgot the name of the sign of my book. Breaking Away. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Breaking Away. It's a great movie. Uh, it's a funny movie. There are tons of laughs in Breaking Away. It's uh, it's got a lot of drama. It's a good sports movie, and uh, you'll be you'll be like on the edge of your seat and cheering at the end, and uh, you'll be laughing all throughout the middle. And I bring that movie up because many of you have never heard of it and have never seen it. So I'll go with that in defending your life, which uh, I always always put on that list. And uh, by the way, you can get your books signed. Go to Premier Collectibles dot com slash Carolla. I'm signing them as we speak. Yes, Matt. And just going to say you recently interviewed uh, Dennis Quaid on your podcast and it was a fantastic interview. You guys talked about that movie and a lot more. So highly suggest that.
Yes. Next up, this is uh, from Jose in Alhambra, California. Beautiful Alhambra. What is a tip you can give for getting back in shape? I have all your other books, too, by the way. Been following and consuming your work for a long time. Thank you. Jose, uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I don't feel like there are any shortcuts or miracle anything. It's, it's so tempting. I mean, everyone wants... Everyone wants that pill. You know, you hear those commercials, it turns fat into muscle, or you take that pill and it's like you've eaten a five course meal. You're not hungry in it. And I, I get it. I get it. That's what everyone wants. Everyone wants to do everything, but what we're supposed to do, you know? And what I would say is <clears throat> first thing in terms of being, getting in shape, don't be in a hurry. If, if you need results in 10 days, forget it. Just start moving. Start moving that direction. Incremental, little things. I mean, you know all the basics. The, obviously, the no sugar, no grain thing works really well. But start like, start like training yourself. Like, you take something like breakfast. You've been eating breakfast your entire life. You've been told it's the most important meal of the day. You've seen a million commercials for a million breakfast cereals. You've seen a million IHOP commercials. You don't really need breakfast. You, you can get up, have yourself a little coffee, put some heavy cream in there, a little MCT oil, leave the house. You can, it's kind of surprising. It's sad, but it's surprising how little you need to eat. I was, uh, at my shop about five years ago, there's a guy named uh, Casey Millette. He's a ex Datsun driver and builder, and he came over to help me set up the suspension on a car, getting it ready for a, a race. And uh, and I'll tell you this story just to have your eyes open and sort of absorb information. And uh, I said to him, "Hey, Casey, we're going to go out to the kebab hut or whatever for lunch. You want to come with us?" eat lunch. And he said, he just looked at me and he said, I don't eat lunch. And I remember thinking, well, that's weird. Who doesn't eat lunch? Everyone eats lunch. That's what I've been doing my whole life. You, you go to school, the bell rings at eight Oh six and then it rings at noon. And that's, that's lunchtime. You eat your lunch. And the whole time I work construction, you start swinging your hammer at 7 AM. And then at noon, the lunch truck comes by and you eat lunch. Everyone just ate lunch. And that's what we did. And I thought Casey was a little strange for not eating lunch, but I didn't know if it was a health thing or religious thing, or maybe he's out of money. Then I started to realize as I learned more and I spoke to Vinnie Tortorich and you start thinking about the coffee and the oil, and how it kind of satiates and the MCT and all that kind of stuff. And the next thing you know, I'm skipping lunch. And I thought it was crazy talk a couple of years ago and now I routinely don't eat lunch and, and I don't miss it and I've just sort of trained myself. So you have to kind of break whatever that pattern is you think. And also you're fighting society because society is pushing all the breakfast and all the breakfast bars and all the cereal and all the stuff. And, you know, you need a hearty breakfast and it's the most important meal of the day. And then at lunch, there's a drive through and God damn, when someone makes a run, someone's making an in and out run. Are you in? Are you out? Uh, little, little bits of training. My feeling is like, I always just go, oh no, I'm good. And then as soon as they leave, I feel bad. I wanted an in and out burger, but they were leaving. And I just said no and kept walking. So incremental intermittent fasting is is really good and you really have no idea how little you physically need to eat and uh as far as exercise goes uh, don't bite off more than you can chew and don't have a don't have this all or nothing mentality i i do a half hour on my rowing machine every night but it, it does happen on occasion where I'm on the road and I got up real early in Boston and we took a 7:30 flight back to LA and blah, blah, blah. And I did late shows the night before and somewhere on Sunday, 
when it's time to hit the rowing machine for a half hour, I'm just gassed out. Like, I'm so tired from traveling. I'm so tired from the last few days. I'm a little hungover. And there's a part of me that goes, well, not tonight. Not tonight. You, you, you were working all weekend. You got up early. You had too many cocktails the night before. Forget today. Give yourself a pass. But then I realize the rowing machine has a bunch of different settings. It's got a 30-minute setting, but also has a 20-minute setting and a 10-minute setting and a 15-minute setting. And I think to myself, all right, how about just do the 20-minute? How about that? And then I go do the 20 minute and I don't, I don't beat myself up for doing the 20 versus the 30. But the point is, is I didn't miss a day of rowing and you have to kind of balance it that way. Balance your life that way. Yes, Matt. All right. we got a couple more here. Here's one from uh, Nicholas in Buena Park, California. What's been grinding your gears lately? Uh, what's grinding my gears lately is truth and people's relationship with the truth and then how they convey that and i'm kind of at the point where i'm not sure if people are lying or they believe it happened that way even in the face of having the information i guess i'm pertaining it to the news mainly but also just to individuals i i constantly think about individuals who are sort of having their own truth and knowing what they're knowing in their heart and and facts and statistics and data can all be damned and i thought you know the computer and the digital age and the phone you have you know you're holding in your hand something that used to be the size of a, a wallet that people would hold in their hand and it's an incredible computing device that has all the truth you want in it. If you want to find out how many people died of COVID-19 and how many of them were in nursing homes or over the age of 70 versus how many people died of the flu who were under 50 the year before, it's all there. You can find out everything you want with your phone, but we're not interested in that we're getting into some feelings heart thinking the death of math and also kind of a dusting of of lying i was uh driving in listening and it's also dangerous so that's why it's uh got me riled up but i was listening to uh politician stacy abrams when i was driving in on the news and she was talking about that gentleman who was shot to death in the Wendy's parking lot in it uh, in Atlanta, which I don't condone, by the way. But she said, just because you fall asleep in your car, you shouldn't be executed by the cops. And I thought, right, there was a part between falling asleep in the car and being shot by the cops. There was a part where you wrestled with the cops. Now you can say that still doesn't warrant that kind of brutality on behalf of the cops. I agree with that, but you can't leave out the part where you wrestle with the cops because otherwise you're just saying you went to your car and you fell asleep in your car and the cops executed you or you go to get fast food and you never return home. Um, now, it's a form of lying, and I get it. I also wonder why most people these days are having difficulty with the integrity of the things they say, meaning you may have an agenda, Stacey Abrams. I'm, I'm guessing you do. The problem is, is in the past, dignity would have prevented you from couching that incident the way you described it. There is a way to do it, which is he went to the Wendy's. He was intoxicated, apparently. He fell asleep or passed out in his car. I do not recommend that for most citizens or my own children. Then he got out. Then there was a physical alteration. And then the cops used deadly force when they shouldn't have. 
or possibly another, there was another way to end that conflict that did not involve deadly force. And if you say that, Stacey Abrams, then I'm all ears. But when you say man goes to a Wendy's drive through falls asleep, cops kill him, that means to me you're leaving out many particulars in this story. And uh, it also says to me you have an agenda. And the news does it, and politicians do it, and it's a right-left thing. Everybody does it. And it, But what scares me the most is the news. I didn't think the news was going to pick up on that kind of reporting. I didn't know this is what we were going to get. I didn't know that we were going to have our health secretary from California get up there and just babble on about statistics that don't mean anything to anybody. And her biggest concern is people walking on the beach or laying down on the beach in Southern California. I didn't know there was going to be an, an utter destruction of data, math, information, and it was all just going to be put through the prism of whatever your political agenda was and spat out that way. I didn't know we we're going to get to that world. Um, I don't really blame the politicians because they have an agenda. I worry about uh, the news outlets who are involved with this. And then more importantly, the super dumb adults who listen to what these ass wipes say. That's the real problem. You know, people always say to me like, oh, well, this politician saying this or this news outlet saying that. It's like, yeah, but don't you understand what they're doing? Why are you listening? What's your excuse? You're not doing the math. Do the math. You do the math. Politicians are done doing the math. CNN's done doing the math. You're going to have to do the math on CNN. Nice. Thank you. Well, we got one more question here. Right. And again, we just want to say thank you to everybody for submitting your questions, for uh, checking out the Facebook Live. Again, you can check out I'm your emotional support animal navigating our all woke, no joke culture. Get your signed copy, Premier, premiercollectibles.com slash Corolla. This last question is an important one. It's from Elizabeth in Los Gatos, California. Adam, how can we unite our country? Thanks for the book. Well, um, first things first, we have to stop beating up our country. Now, I don't want to sound like, you know, Republican senator from blah, blah. I'm just saying we live in a good country. It's generally good. It doesn't mean there are things about it we don't need to fix. It's a generally good country. I will, uh, I'll liken it to a 1999 Ford Explorer. It's a generally good vehicle. It doesn't mean it never breaks. It doesn't need any maintenance. It didn't, there's no room for improvement. No, it means it's generally a good vehicle. You show me a Fiat from the 70s, I'm going to show you a piece of shit that's constantly broken down and needs to be fixed and needs to be towed and spends most of its adult career at the garage being worked on by a guy with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth who speaks with a strong Sicilian accent. But what we are is not that. So we're good, steady, reliable transportation. Well, you're comparing us to other countries. That's all you can do. And in the time when we're talking about it, right? So I don't know, are we, you know, a Lexus? Are we a BMW? I don't know. Are we uh, an Audi? I know there's pretty excellent cars. Maybe that's Sweden. Maybe uh, that's one of the Nordic countries or maybe even Japan. But we are good, reliable transportation. We're a Toyota Camry, a Ford Explorer. Okay, now, shall we change our oil? Shall we put air in our tires? Shall we uh, change the timing belt or chain every 70,000 miles? Yes, let's maintain it, and let's even improve it. Let's get one of those, uh, let's get one of those seat liners that has, the, that has the beads on it, that has the wooden beads on it. 
Let's get one of those. Put one of those in. Let's put a uh, put like a Bluetooth adapter or something so we can hook it up to our phone and listen to all our our favorite tunes. Let's uh, let's get that air conditioning recharged with Freon so we can get a little cold air blowing. But we're generally good. And my only thing is, is let's understand that there's breakdowns. There are things we need to fix. There are things we need to maintain. But we're generally a good reliable transportation country stop turning us into some finicky fiat from the 70s that's always busted down and always in the shop that isn't us we're better than that and the notion of constantly beating people over the head with how you know this country systemically racist and oppresses and what first off what is a better country if you're a woman Is there a better country than this country? You make people miserable. You make them unhappy. You put a target on their back. You make them a victim, and then they can't flourish. Once you think yourself a victim, you can't flourish, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Come to this country. It's a meritocracy. Outwork everyone around you, and you shall flourish. And our country is fine. So the first thing we need to do is stop dividing everybody and deciding that this group's oppressed and that group has privilege. That's that's a math that will kill us. How could you possibly run a nation that way? These groups have targets on their back. This other group are the ones who are oppressing them. They have privilege. That's a recipe for goddamn disaster. We must stop hanging labels on everyone talking about groups constantly. This country's pretty good when you just kind of get out of the way, get to work, get a job and fight to keep it. And the other thing you need is you need employment. You have to have employment. You have to have that pride. The devil makes work for idle hands. You need to have a job. You need to have a job and you need to have a skill and you need to get a sense of pride. It is not about the paycheck. If you go out every week and you apply yourself and you go to work and you have a trade and you get 1200 bucks at the end of the week, you come home satisfied. If the government gives you, if Andrew Yang gives you 1200 bucks a week, it is completely different. It is empty calories. It is nothing. My kids, the difference between the meal you and your family make at home versus the meal you tell the boy to bring over from the Gelson's is completely and utterly different. And this even has a bigger chasm than that. This notion of, well, there's people that don't have money, so if we gave them money, then they would be out of problems and they'd be happy. That's like saying homeless people, the reason they're on the streets is because they don't have a home. So then give them a house and then they'll have a home and then we'll solve the problem. Yeah, get back to me on how that works, bitch. That doesn't work. People need to be engaged. They need dignity. They need a sense of purpose. And this whole dignity thing where it's like, you got to respect me. You got to respect me. You better respect me. Fuck that. How about you respect yourself? How about you get to work? Get to work. Focus on a skill. Apply your trade. And tell me if we don't become collectively happier as a nation. I'm Adam Carolla. And even though I'm running unopposed, I still need your vote.